can be only one podcast, and may it be the Prince of the Universe. Hi, folks. I'm Matt. And I'm Wes. Hey. Hey. Still going through the books that you gave me uh, to read, and I've enjoyed my homework, my reading homework here. Excellent. Uh, you gave me two ECW books. You did tell me one was better than the other. Yes. Uh, the first one, I cannot remember what it was called now. Uh-oh. I did, I just, it just left my mind. It's in that box somewhere. It's okay. Um, it's... I don't. You're looking Turning at both. Turning the tables. Turning the tables. That's what it was. And, and then hardcore, hardcore history. history. Hardcore history being the better one, the one you should read. Um, Turning the tables. Don't know much, but it feels like it was written by a fan, and not someone with insider knowledge. I don't know who that guy is, but <clears throat> John Lister. Uh, I'm not familiar with John Lister's work either. Okay. Because oh there he is he's the author of Slamology and gives Slamthology Slamthology the T H is not Sh- silent the, okay so the thing is though he gives bullet points on certain th- events that happen he quotes TV like he went on YouTube and just wrote down word for word what the interview said right and we didn't need all of it and gave just basic it's like a fan. Pointing to all, it's like he wanted to sit down and talk to you for four hours about ECW. He took 30 pages and stretched it to... Yeah, he did. And I mean, it's informational, but it's not the best. And the better one is the hardcore history. But I, like I said, like some of it was just like bullet points. Right. And then sometimes, where are they now? That book was written, I think, 2005 or whatever. Yeah. Where are they now? Some of them are wrestling. Some of them are not anymore. And I was like, oh, okay. But it was like a bullet point for each one. Right. He does bullet points a lot when he just wants to talk about different things. It's like, hey, here's some notes I made that I thought would fit in the book. I don't know where, but I'll put it in this chap- I quotation mark chapter. Right. So it's not the best. It gives you information, but it seems like it's from a fan's point of view instead of an insider's point of view. You know, where hardcore history is a lot more in depth. Right. And so that's what we're going to talk about today, hardcore history. Um, they said that, and I agree with this, it was a perfect time for ECW to come up because uh, WCW was still, you know, n- n- nothing was going on in WCW. Ted Turner wasn't really, he, he, he let it show on his program, but he wasn't really pushing it. Meanwhile, Vince McMahon is suffering through the steroid trial, and he, they think that took a lot of focus from his wrestling story and correct it, it suffered just like the wbf took a lot of his focus just like the xfl took a lot of his focus uh, right no right and you can you can tell when vince's head is in the game and when vince's head is not in the yeah, game yeah that's true that's true but they said that was that was the perfect time for ecw to come up and get its own little niche correct which was true now i remember back in the day i never watched an ecw live everyone had the vhs tapes and we'd watch some vhs tapes did you Get VHS yeah, tapes back. Yeah, in the I had day. VHS tapes. Uh, I saw ECW live a handful of times. Um, oh, you did? Yeah. Well, pay per views or no? Uh, we went to some house shows. Uh, we went to a t- when ECW was on TNN. Uh, we went to a TV taping oh, in wow. New Orleans and saw that. Uh, but I went to an ECW house show that was headlined by the Dudleys against New Jack, Tommy Dreamer, and Sandman, and it was. I latched on to Heath Futch in fear because there was almost a riot. <laughs> Over with what? how angry Bubba Ray Dudley was on cutting promos on those fans. It was probably wow. about a thousand people there. There was a porn star time Bry- Byron was there too. I think that's when they did the nude world order porn. Oh. Anybody there you go. check that out. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I hear it's good. But yeah, Sweet. it was like it was a I mean, there were people wanting to come over the railing. Uh, yeah. Wow. Rowdy crowd. Rowdy crowd. They did talk about how ECW fans were called smart marks. Correct. Before that was a thing. Right. People just gobbled wrestling stories up. But these guys were smarter than that. And if Paul Heyman could fool them, it was all, I mean, that was just all the more shocking. Sure. For and they appreciated that. Yep. Um, and they talked about how at one point, this is back when WCW still didn't have the money, ECW was selling out more shows in certain cities than WCW. Mm. Is that true? And uh, Where they were around, Philadelphia and stuff like that. Well, you got to think, end. too. Could, could, that, could that be true? Po- possibly so, because WCW did book a lot of buildings that they could not sell out. But ECW did not book buildings that were bigger. But there... 
and, and, and I don't want to talk about it now, but there is a Eric Bischoff book you gave me that I have yes. read that we'll talk about later mm-hmm. that he does admit that attendance was sad, like just a couple thousand. Oh, yeah, very for their sad. Shows. Yeah. So it makes me kind of believe that in certain cities, ECW, especially around the hometown, that they I, probably I, drew more. I, I, no? think that's, I think that's being pretty creative okay. with your numbers. Okay, that's fine. That's all. That's fine. But all I right. think ECW... They're, they were the beginning of the smaller amount of wrestling fans that were twice as dedicated. Yeah. Which are how most wrestling fans are now with the product. Yeah. Paul Heyman looked at Vince McMahon's lineup and said, this is for kids. It's not for adults. I want to focus on teenagers. I want to make this wrestling and MTV all together. Punk rock. Punk rock wrestling. Punk rock wrestling. Which, you know, trying to make it cool, trying to appeal to that audience. And he got that niche For sure. that he wanted. Um, the fans were, they oh, well, the whole, the shows were very interactive with fans. They talk about people throwing chairs in the ring. I remember seeing that clip. Yep. They talk about, uh, I can't remember who it was who would always dance, and they'd invite everyone to dance on the ring, and the whole ring collapsed. Public enemy. <clears throat> Public enemy. And how fans would bring weapons to the shows that they would use. Correct. And so fans really enjoyed that interaction. And I can see where that would that would be that would lead to some popularity. I went to a house show years ago in Monroe. Uh, Edge was fighting Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle was the bad guy, Edge was the good guy, but we just loved Kurt Angle so much we were cheering for Kurt Angle. Sure. Boo and Edge every time. We were right there second row. Mm. Not not for front row, but second row. After it's over, Edge is, you know, Kurt Angle's laid out in the ring because Edge won. Edge is marching down. He stops, turns around, jumps over the railing in on into on our row right next to us. Sticks his, puts his thumb to his nose, d- wiggles his fingers, and gives gives sticks out his tongue. You know, just kind of, blah, 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 you know, because he heard us. Sure, he wanted you to know. I heard you. I right. know. What you, I know you're just being jerks. Right. But lovable. Not not. There wasn't anything intimidating. It was just fun. And I I cannot tell you. We could not stop grinning. We were like little boys. I remember the guy next to me goes, he said, I'm not ashamed to admit it. He said, he said, I feel like a little boy at Christmas. He said, that just, that just made me so happy. I said, no, it made me so happy too. Sure. And he knew that we knew it was all, we didn't really hate him. We just wanted to be Correct. jerks and cheer for the, you know, switch it up. Yeah. But he wanted us to know that he heard us. Yeah. And that little interaction just made me the hugest edge fan. It's weird. But that little interaction, just like I like this guy, right. you know. Uh, have you? Did you ever? I mean, you went to several shows. Have you ever had an interaction? I actually have had a story similar to that. Um, we were at a house show in New Orleans for WWF, uh, probably, probably ninety seven, and we were front row, and it was a match between uh, John B- Bradshaw Layfield when he was still one of the Blackjacks and Mark Marrow, and they were brawling outside. And Mark Marrow was right in front of us, and he like leaned over the rail, and he was saying, "Ah, this really doesn't hurt." And then J. Bell hit him really hard, and he goes, "Oh, that really hurt." And like <laughs> he was very much what they call back in the day, working with the guy in the front row. Like he was keeping everyone engaged. That's a good wrestler. Correct. You know, because there's no TV, you can be a little looser, much like what you referenced with Edge. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've I've been around it. To That's that true. Degree. That's true. I should mention they're, they they'd be more looser in a house show Correct. than they would on TV. Yet ECW on TV was interacting with fans in ways that the other companies well, weren't. Well, because ECW was very um, edited. An ECW show is very kind of cut and paste. Right. You really would not see a long eight minute no. match. Not that eight minute match is long. Um, if I had a match, it was eight minutes. I would. Well, that's something else. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just saying that it's it's different TV wrestling. So, yeah, it was just it was it was shot differently. Uh, talked about, and I don't, I don't remember because I never watched all of ECW besides a few videos or anything. But Shane Douglas was the man who carried ECW for the first couple of years. The franchise. Right? He was the franchise, and he truly was. Is that the is that the case? Was he like something you were like, whoa? Because I watched a few yeah, of his stuff I think, afterwards. You know, anybody that's a, uh, an ECW fan definitely looks at Shane Douglas's career in ECW drastically different than it was everywhere else. Oh, true. Uh, yeah, I mean, man, Shane Douglas was the man when the Triple Threat was happening in '97 with Bam Bam and Chris Candino. He was yeah. awesome. He was juiced up and. 
ready to go. Cussing and fussing and very engaging. And uh, he had a very stone cold edge. I guess you could look at it that way. They they said that Paul Heyman, where he would always just almost lie to the wrestlers. <laughs> uh, he never lied to the fans, is what they said. And uh, like when, well, well, that's what this book says. I'm just quoting it. Like they, and then they gave some examples of he promised them a refund if because so and so couldn't make it and they Sabu. all knew who couldn't make it. He said, "I'll give you a refund. However, wait till the main event." You know, do me a favor and wait till the main event. Sure. If you don't like the, who I've replaced it with, and <clears throat> but they say he did a lot of stuff like that, and you would say he did lie to the fans. Well, I, I just I, I'm fine with that. I'm just no, I'm, just I'm not. I know that there's a story where I don't know if he told fans or he told like guys in the business at the first November to remember pay per view. Um, he went around telling the guys that Slash was going to play the national anthem. The fans or the wrestlers? Like the wrestlers. Okay. So I'm well, not I said saying, he'd, he'd lie to the wrestlers. Yeah, I'm just saying, like, you, he might have, like, I'm just saying, like, if you're going to stretch the truth to the boys that much, you're probably going to lie to everybody around you. Probably so. If you saw probably those so. fans at the Waffle House at 2.30 in the morning, and they're like, hey, we're going to be at November, remember? And he's like, man, you're going to love it. Slash is going to be there. He's going to play the national anthem. I and can see Paul Hayden yeah. saying that. Yeah. I, uh, this book does not say that, but... I, sure. I can see that. Uh, I like the Raven story. Raven got the call. He was so high, he forgot what day Paul Heyman said, so he just showed up one day, and Paul goes, what are you doing here? You're a week early. He went, oh, okay, good, because he knew he had the job. He, just, he was too high to remember. Right. He said, I'm just here. I just want to get a, meet the guy. Yeah, he said, I'm just, I'm just getting a feel out. That's all I'm doing yeah. here. Um, that was really funny. Um, it. Uh, the, they said that the rise and fall of ECW video from WWE right. was slanted because it made it look like, I never saw this, but it made it look like Vince saved the company. He was the one upholding the company with that big loan. Is that true? To, to the victor goes the spoils. <clears throat> I mean, I mean, yeah, but they're saying that was all slanted. That was not the case. Vince wasn't single-handedly propping up, but he had like over half a million invested, right? Well, he, pay, he Paul was on a salary every week. Right, right. A thousand dollar. you know, he... They used WWF guys. Yeah. They used Draws. They used Flash Funk. Al Snow. They used Al Snow and Mc- made him a star. Yep. So, yeah, they had a lot of guys that they used. Um, to, I, I'm sure Vince floated a lot of it. Yeah. They said that the WWE didn't know what to do with Rod Van Dam. Would you agree? 100%. Didn't know what to do with him. Okay. He was too <clears> stiff, <throat> and he was not going to give in to what they wanted. Yeah, he had a devil may care. He didn't care attitude. Yeah, I mean he, he's the one that went to Vince and said he didn't want to go overseas for the tribute to the troop show, and Vince was so offended and yeah. caused a bit. Well, you know, I mean the guy can say whatever he wants, right? Yeah. At the same time, uh, it talks about all the Dudley boys. Um, I I. Don't I mean besides the popular ones, Devon and Bubba Ray and even Spike, who appeared later on. Right. I did not know about any of the others. You didn't know Big Dick. D- d- I no, no. I, I heard him, but I never seen him. Oh. But there were some more though. Yeah, there's there's like there's a of big them. family, and, and Big Dick was the first one, right? Or wasn't he one of the first? I don't know if he was the first. One. Okay, who was the first? Was it Devon? I can't. I don't. I don't know the family tree that well. Okay, my question to you is: How good was the rest of them? Uh. So good that you don't know who they are. Oh, okay, got it. Got it. So not so good. Got yeah. it. Okay, good Good answer. <laughs> um, uh, they talks about the relationship between Paul and Vince, like you said, having wrestlers on loan, being insider. The, the wrestlers, did, he told the wrestlers, no, I'm not connected to Vince McMahon. And supposedly the story goes that one wrestler called WWE and asked to speak with... Uh, Paul Heyman, and they said, well, here, let me get you to his office. And it's the answer machine there, and like, you are working there. So, again, lying. But as a promoter, he's trying to do his best. It, they said he didn't take any money for himself. He wore the same clothes, drove a van, you know. He didn't take any money. All the money was put back into the uh, uh, well, business. Paul was never a good businessman. I mean, that's that's well documented that... Yeah, he's kind of like Mick Foley. He wears the same clothes to the ring. He wears the same clothes out of the ring. He's traveling in his flannel shirt and sweatpants and 
And I remember when he came and guest starred on Raw as the announcer when, who was it, Jerry King. The King, King left? And I was thinking, wait a minute, because I knew who he was sure. by then. I was like, and, he, and he'd wear, I think he was wearing an ECW cap during that I think too. he was wearing a Yankees hat. Oh, point. Yankees hat. Okay, either way, though, it was very confusing because ECW was still going, but they said it that's just, when. It just went under. Well, that's what they said. Well, it hadn't yet, supposedly. There were still a few more shows to do, but that's when everyone knew we're sunk because he's working at WWE and he's public about it. Yeah. But the, their last show was in uh, somewhere Arkansas. in Arkansas. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. And that they all knew it was going to be their last show. They yeah. knew there wasn't going to be another one. And they probably weren't even going to get paid. They all brought beer out into the ring, drank it, uh, partied with the fans, you know, one last hurrah. Right. And they said the fans who were smart enough knew too sure. this is going to be it. So right. it was one last hurrah. Um, <clears throat> uh, what is this? Uh, oh, they talked about Todd Gordon and how he got let go. Trying to get a bunch of wrestlers to defect from ECW. Yeah, Todd Gordon was basically the guy that started started uh, ECW, ECW. Yeah, Eastern Championship Wrestling. Um, Todd's money came out of the jewelry business. He was a big jeweler in Philadelphia. Oh, I don't think it said that. And that's a lot of where his money came from. And he was working uh, somewhat as a mole, same way with Bill Alfonso, um, to get guys into WCW because their connection was with Kevin Sullivan. Right. And when that came out, Todd was gone. And the way Fonzie kept his job was he had that match with Beulah, which if anybody's never seen that, go see it. It's a great piece of business, as they say. Okay. He bleeds, he sells. They have an incredible brawl for a guy, an untrained wrestler, in a valet, it's pretty incredible. It's it's as ECW as you can get. Um, now the thing is, and they say a lot of things that it's funny. Dark Side of the Ring covered a lot of the stuff that's in this book, right? I mean, almost verbatim. Like the mass transit thing is discussed there. Sure. The and it's almost like, well, I saw Dark Side of the Ring. You have nothing to offer me, but it's this the same story. Well, and you where think, if you if you didn't have seen that, then there's tons of other right, stuff. This in was there. ten years before. Before at least they they do talk about at the end that they felt like ECW got a fantastic send off with its one night stand was that what it was called Yep the WWF had a pay per view called One Night Stand and it did really really well and that's what rejuvenated them to think maybe there's something else here Okay but I don't think they but all the boys came back for it and it a was lot a, of them. a yeah. lot of them came back for it for one final match and. They all had brilliant matches, is what was said, and it felt like for that one night ECW is back. You appreciating ECW? Did you feel that way? I don't. I, I never saw. Yeah, this I think that it, that the show was great. Um, I think that you know that's why they did it again, and then re, re jumped the brand off. So I mean, they had two one night stands, and then they jumped the brand. I think that uh, what hurt the the restart was obviously. You had people that were in charge of ECW that weren't in charge of it. Well, they said that McMahon wanted the ECW people to lose to all the WWE people, right. too. It's the same and they said thing it was just for the invasion booking. and all of the other stuff. Yeah. It was you basically know. just sent up to make sure that WCW wrestlers are beneath us. Make sure that ECW wrestlers are beneath the best of the best, which is WWE. Well, then right. that leads to no story whatsoever. It leads to <clears> a very stale product. Yeah. Yep. Which ha- happens in wrestling over and over and over again. Correct. It's it's funny how in each and one of these books they complain about one certain thing, but then history is repeating them right right there in the face again. Well, um, if you go work for Vince, that's what you're going to put up with. You know, he. It's not that he. This is a surprise. No, oh no, but it's it's funny how they don't see it in these books. Oh, well, they see it. Well, some of them don't. I, oh, I won't talk about them yet, but that's in a future podcast. But there's one that he complained, this was the problem. This is why they ran out. And I was thinking, that's exactly what happened to you. That's exactly what happened to you. You did the same. You acted the same exact way. Um, another question about ECW. Where Are there any ECW wrestlers still wrestling today? Rob Van Dam still around. Really? Yeah, where, he, got, where? he got inducted to the Hall of Fame. I mean, he still does like. Appearances so and stuff. Where I mean, independent scene. 
I don't know how much he works. Okay. But, I mean, I know he's worked in the past year. Okay. I did yeah. not know that. I thought they'd all retired by now. No. Yeah, he's been in Impact. <clears throat> he's still around. Okay, I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing, Paul Heyman, what's he doing now? He is the manager for the WWE champion, Roman Reigns. Oh, Roman Reigns now. Okay. He's been on TV for last the past I, four years. Last I saw him, he was, he was pushing Brock. Yep. Well, he's probably he the Roman. best mouthpiece in WWE. Good at his job. Yep. One of the would you say one of the best managers? If that's what his title is, manager, right? Yeah, and I, I mean it's hard to say that because there's nobody left. Oh, okay. Well, but, hold on then. Let me back up. Okay. I'm just going to sidebar this. How? What? Give me your top five managers of all time. On I'm the, putting you on the on, spot there. Yeah. Not, not in any order. <clears throat> just who would you put in that top five? Bobby Hannon, Cornette, Paulie, Gary Hart. And uh, Skandar Akbar. Okay. Wow. That was quick. <laughs> so you did put Paul E. You're talking I about did. Paul Heyman. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. you did put him in there. So he would rank among the best. I do. I mean, I put him in there because of everything. He's the last of the Mohicans kind of thing. Uh, yeah, you're right. There's not that many managers anymore. Right. And he's, he's, really he's playing the out last of... of anything that was like... You know, when he was in the Dangerous Alliance, and he did all of his stuff in Florida and Memphis. Are there any more valets? Is that another thing that's kind of disappeared over Uh, time? They're still around a little bit. Yeah. Okay. But back in the day, you always had a... Now, the manager's job was always to do the talking, right? Because the wrestlers couldn't? Yes. That's how it started. That's how, yeah. We we got wrestlers, Mike's skills are a little less, so let's give him a manager who can build him up. Exactly. And what was the purpose of a valet? Just for looks? Um... Yes. Okay. Pretty girl out there with a guy. A but guy that's going to make people hate him even hey, Everyone more. fell in love with Miss Elizabeth back in the day. So. It's a blueprint to success. Okay. Do you have a top five valets? Mm. Probably not. That's not. It's it's hard to be a memorable valet. Yeah. I, I where mean, a manager can really make his mark. I would say probably, obviously, Elizabeth's up there. Missy Hyatt is way up there. That would probably be the two the of two my you, youth. Yeah. And precious with Jimmy it's like Garvey. saying best announcers or commentators or something like that. Yeah, it's so subjective. Yeah. So it's like <clears> saying <throat> best baseball players. You know, you can't it's kind of hard to do that. It is, but I, I would have I could do that because of favorites. I could give you my favorites. That's the only thing. Um out of ECW, the people that I remember liking was Rob Van Dam. Uh really got to see most of these people after they, you know, after ECW got folded into the storyline, the invasion right. storyline. Uh, they did talk about how they had to call them ECW WCW the Alliance because technically at the time they didn't have the rights to ECW. There was a a lot of bankruptcy stuff tied up in court. Okay. So Vince had to stop using the word ECW. He had to be creative, so he wasn't on the hook for it. But he owns it now. Correct. He bought so. it out of bankruptcy. But Well, there you go. And He picked the bones like he always does. Well, yeah, of course. He's a and, smart businessman. Well, he has a huge wrestling library because of it. Indeed. You know, he's like the, uh, as his arch nemesis is Ted Turner. He, exactly. He did the exact same thing. But he does the thing. exact same thing that Ted Turner does. He just didn't buy up the Wizard of Oz. He just bought up everything else. True. True. So, yeah. Now, it was... Um, it, it, both. I mean, both books, like I said, are interesting. But if you... Uh, hardcore... I already forgot the name of it now. Hardcore History. Hardcore History is a pretty solid book about the ECW. I think you have to know a little bit more about the ECW than I did. Because a lot of the old matches, a lot of the old stuff they were talking about, great. Some of that stuff is very hard to find. I told you some things on YouTube for WCW and stuff, and right. WWE are easier to find. ECW, not as much. You know, the, the when they talk about the pay per view or the whatever one night, not one night stand, but something else. It, those are a little bit harder to find. Right. I, I, well, for me at least, they're on Peacock. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. That's where all the wrestling is. Yep. They share something. Was that WWE Network? Did they go there? They bought it. They sold I their library. Did not know that. Okay. Doing so these wrestling podcasts. Pre-con. Well, I didn't good know where got, it was streaming. Good thing you got the mouth of the South sitting beside you. I'm telling you. I'm telling you. But um, okay. Well, um, uh, uh, ask you this about. I did not like Sandman, but he may have been older back when I saw him. Uh, 
Tommy Dream. I, I like I said, it seems like a lot of these people, Mikey Shipwreck, all these names. Whipwreck. Whipwreck, sorry. There you go. See? Um a lot of these people Shipwreck, I didn't really... I believe is a G.I. Joe character. We want to talk about Is he that. really? Yeah, wow, that's maybe where I got it. With no, the, I don't remember. With the parrot? Oh yeah, I do remember a guy with the parrot. Come that was Shipwreck. On. I don't remember his name. But uh Jeez. there uh did you have a favorite ECW wrestler? Van Dam and Sabu. Tough. See, I never got to see Sabu either. Tough and, to say is my favorite out of those two. But Sabu, I mean, besides, I mean, I got to see some of his matches. Yeah. On on YouTube, and he is he's one of the high flyer, dare, daredevil, very hardy like, you know, willing to try anything, put his body through anything, sure. Jeff Hardy like thing. Um, so I didn't get to see him, but he just kind of, and he was the, he's really the Sheik's nephew, right? Yeah. The wow. Andy Farhat, the real. Sheik, not the Iron Sheik, yeah. Wow, wow. Mm-hmm. Um, so what happened to him? Why didn't he come back? Sabu did come back. Oh, he did? I just don't remember that then. Yeah. But okay. He's, you know, Sabu is a very different kind of guy. Okay. He's not going to do business. He, he's harder to do business than it was for Van Damme. Yeah. Uh, they talk about the Stone, Stone Cold, well, Steve Austin before Stone Cold, and I didn't know he was only on ECW for like one week, is it like, right? Yeah, like three shows. Or he something. cut the promo, did a few things, and left for the WWE. And the rest is the, the you know ringmaster, and then yeah. from there on out. So I, it's funny because as I, I don't know, I, as you look back on this, I thought, oh yeah, he got popular on ECW, and then the WWE took notice of him. That wasn't the case. It looks like he was just there part time until the contract was finalized. Yeah, basically he needed to get. I would say what they call that is getting ring rust off. And he was close with Paulie because Paulie was his manager in the Dangerous Alliance. That's true. So, That's true. Yeah. You know, he went up there, and basically, you know, Austin sat there all night and wanted to watch what everybody did, and then he cut his promo at whatever it was, three a.m. or something. And it is you see, you know what Bret Hart says. Well, he saw this, and everybody who watches that promo goes, "Oh." That guy's a star. Yeah, and that way before he cut his hair, way before he had a goatee. That's true. I was gonna say way before he was that the, promo, the persona. That is money. Yeah, mic drop and promo. Yeah, uh, pulled from the heart. A lot of a lot of things. Oh, that's the other thing. Fans, there's I, this is another one. The fans were just shocked about the Sandman putting someone put a cigarette out in his eye. They acted like this was all impromptu. Shouldn't have gone that far. He had to wear an eye patch. And then later on, the big reveal is he takes the eye patch off and he's completely fine. Then wallops on the guy. Right. But they said there's a collective, ga- and I really wanted to see this. I couldn't find it. But there's like a gasp in the audience because it fooled them too. The smart right. marks. Right. And then they went wild. Like wow, they got one over on us that we bought it. And fans really appreciated that you know because you know that we know we're smart, but right. that you still were able to pull something off. Right, yeah. I remember that one was one I wanted to... There's a lot of scenes in the book that they talked about, and I was like, well, where, I want to see that. I went, Where is that? And they, it was just hard to find. But I guess it's on the Peacock. Some of it is. I mean, if you can't find it on YouTube, it's got to be there. One of the two you yeah, can find just about everything. And like I said, the ECW, the old shows and stuff like that, they were just harder to find. And WWF is going to edit that stuff so much now because of what's not safe to show and, and things. So that may not even exist anymore. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. They change all that stuff up. What's too, it's quote unquote too violent? Really? Yeah. It's wrestling. We're woke now. Oh. That's sad. Kinda so it's like, like how kids Disney. won't go to sleep. They're yeah, woke. Exactly. They, they are awoke. Um, it's like Disney Plus editing out certain things from cartoons that, from cartoons that may not be as say forgiving like, you know, this may trigger fans. You know, like but, taking Mark Twain out of and Huckleberry Finn out of libraries forty years ago. It's not much difference. Okay. Well, I mean, it's sad because there's no way to watch the full unedited clip anymore. Gotta get those so those VHSs are <laughs> rising in value, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Well, they were edited too, but I'm sure they kept some of the violent stuff in it, right? Yeah, of course. Yeah, all the, what's there is there. They just chopped up what was chopped up. Got so, it. Well, they yeah. just for time and to get it on a VHS. <clears throat> yeah, they would shoot it then edit it later, which was fine because that's where they made a ton of their sales at first. Correct. And how they got out there. And I, like I said, 
a lot of people who were into wrestling back in the late nineties also had ECW tapes they wanted to show me. Yeah, tape trading. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. you were part of that too. But all right, there you go. Another great book. So thanks for letting me borrow it. Anything for you. All right, we got some even better ones coming up next time. I'm excited. Uh, me too. Excellent. All right. We'll see you next time, folks, on Princes of the Universe.